Good evening, everyone. It's with great joy that I am here again at the Spiritist Society of Baltimore. It is uh, a wonderful experience uh, to come here because I get to sit in my car for four hours and there are no distractions except an infinite amount of number of phone calls. <laughs> get in contact with uh, friends uh, who I haven't contacted in a while due to a busy life. So it's, I like coming in here for that reason. It gives me time to think and uh, contact friends. Today's topic will be obsession. Now, since uh, we are aware that we're being recorded, and this information eventually uh, will be on YouTube uh, throughout the, uh, the Spiritist channel that Daniel created, I'm always concerned with who will be listening to this message. Because we are here at a stage of implementation of something new. It's a new philosophy that we're trying to spread, we're trying to disseminate. So for that reason, uh, I take into consideration not only the public who is sitting before us, but most importantly, the people who, are, who will be watching on YouTube. Because if someone hears this message from a wrong perspective, or we give too much to them, it would actually disencourage them uh, from researching furthermore. You know, if you've been to college and they started speaking to you in the world of mathematics and the first day of school they gave you physics, you know, that would scare you away. They start with simple algebraic equations and then we get to more complex ones such as physics. And I explained this in the beginning of our lecture like this one. Uh, because I don't mean to patronize anyone. Uh, I know there are people who are sitting in this audience who have, you know, college degree. And I break that down to such a simple basic steps that someone might feel offended. Uh, so it's not our intentions. Uh, our intention is to take into consideration who will be listening to this message on YouTube. You follow me so far? Yes. Very good. So, Andre Lewis, uh, who is a physician in the afterlife, he attempted to explain what obsession is to us. Now, the reason why I use the word attempted, it's because whenever you read the spiritist uh, knowledge, the spiritist literature, you will find that the spirits have great trouble in explaining things to us. And reason being is because not only they have to mold the message to our level of absorption, but also they have to find terms to describe extremely uh, evolved concepts about human behavior. Uh, a good knowledge to understand the amount of difficulty they have in explaining things to us. You know, if you go back only 20 years, and this is absolutely nothing in the course of history, try to go back 20 years and explain what is a phone application to someone. How do you do it? If you go back 50 years, then becomes impossible. If you go back 100 years, completely forget about it, to make any attempt. You know, the best thing that you can say is that you have a piece of metal and you talk to that piece of metal and someone else holding a similar piece of metal. Not only they could hear you, but they can also see you. And they do things in this uh, piece of metal that helps them keep track of their finances. It helps them translate things. It helps them to uh, buy groceries. Now, how can you explain these things? So. When these books were written, some of them uh, 50, 60 years ago, the spirits are trying to explain highly evolved concepts of human behavior in our language, trying to take into consideration uh, different cultures and our idiosyncrasies, the way we perceive things. 
So it's a challenge for them. This is why I used the word attempted to explain to us. So there is a book called In the Domains of Mediumship. In that book, we understand part of how an obsession works. And Andre Luiz uses the analogy of the radio. And how does a radio work? Now, we all know First of all, when, whenever I draw anything, I have to let people know what I'm drawing. <laughs> That's how good of an artist I am. This is a car. This is a car. <laughs> and if you are in your car and you want to be distracted or informed, there are many different choices. One of them is listening to different radio stations. Now, when you listen to a radio station, you don't listen to just any radio station. You pick your favorite radio station. So what that means, there are different radio stations. Sorry to give my back to you. That's a big no-no in public speaking. There are different radio stations. These are antennas. And these antennas, they send a signal. And that signal, it's not made up of smoke. It's not made up of water. It's not made up of paper. It's made up of waves. Electric magnetic waves. What does that mean? The antenna has a big magnet attached to it. And there is electricity going to that magnet. And as a result, a magnetic wave is produced. So here you are sitting in your car, and you have different options of what you want to listen to. And let's say this is the radio station you want to listen to. Let's give a, a name to this radio station. What's your favorite radio station? Do you listen to one? 101.9. 101 so we're going to call it 101.9. Uh, then we're going to call this one uh, 107. And we're going to call this one 88.5. So although there are different options of radio station, uh, she chooses to listen to 101.9. Now, the interesting thing is the fact that her radio station, I'm sorry, her radio is being bombarded by all these different waves. But she chooses to listen to 101.9. The interesting thing here about these waves are the fact that you know, can we smell them? Can we weight them? Can we see them? Can we touch them? Are they here in this room right now? Yes, they are. Right now, we are surrounded by electric magnetic waves. Our phones are connected to these waves. If we had a TV here, we can actually pick up electric magnetic waves. They are transmitting sound and image. These are everyday phenomena, but we don't stop to think about them. Isn't it impressive that right now in this room, there are waves that are carrying sound and image? Can you hear the sound? Can you see the images? No, you can't. Are they here at this moment right now? Yes, there are an infinite amount of electric magnetic waves in this room right now. The reason we don't see them, we can hear them, we can touch them, it's because we need a receiver. So the car radio, it's what we call a receiver. The antenna that sends the signal, we call it the transmitter. It transmits the wave. 
Now, why is it that you chose to listen to 101.9? Well, that's because these individuals, they deliver news, information, and the kind of music she likes to listen to. So in order for her to make her choice, there has to be affinity between the receiver and the transmitter. What's affinity? What we like. The points that we can enjoy together. The information that we like to share. These are affinities. And when the waves, they meet, when the antenna is actually connected with the radio, we call this synchronization. They are in sync, both waves. And also, there is a, uh, another physical phenomenon that happens. When the wave combines, it produces resonance. They get stronger because they are connected. So here we have the receiver, the transmitter. She chooses to listen to 101.9 because she has affinity for the kind of music they play. And when the both waves are connected together, it's what we call synchronization. These are the uh, ABCs of connection. Now, what that has to do with anything with obsession? Well, everything. Because according to the highly evolved spirits, including Andre Luis, our minds, they work as a receiver and a transmitter. We send information and we receive information. We send information with our thoughts, but then our vocal cords, our entire body, becomes the antenna itself. And then our ears, when we receive someone else's information, becomes the receiver. And our brain decodes the code of the information. So they say that we are constantly transmitting and receiving information. We are living antennas and receiver. Now, we can do this with another individual unconsciously. If you ask a friend of yours who never been to a spiritual center or never read this kind of material, and you ask them, now, have you ever had this experience in which you're thinking about someone and they call you? What happened there? We were synchronized. Have you ever uh, had this experience in which you're walking by a street and you're thinking of a friend and suddenly that friend appeared out of nowhere? What is that? That is synchronization. Our mind synced. In science, they call this serendipity. The fact that you had this uh, coincidence that sprung from nowhere. Now, we understand through the spiritist philosophy, uh, there is no true serendipity. These were synchronizations of time and place with people who are connected with. Now, we all know here in this spiritist philosophy that when we lose this biological machine, we don't cease to exist. We continue to exist in the spirit realm. We no longer use our bodies to communicate, but our minds, our spiritual mind, are still able to communicate information. And then we're going to sync ourselves with whoever we have affinity with. 
we're going to sync ourselves with whoever we have affinity with. Here in the physical plane, people who likes to play basketball, they are in sync together. They have the affinity of playing basketball. People who swim, they are also in sync. This is what they like. The affinity that they have for the sport brings them together. Now, for individuals who are substance abusers, unfortunately, they are also in sync with the same kind of individual. What prompts them to use drugs together? And our affinity, it's very influenced by the people that we mix with. And this influence happens unconsciously. We don't have to be aware of the influence. The influence takes place unconsciously. For example, if you mix with people who likes to swim, before you know it, you're watching swimming on TV. You buy magazines uh, that talks about the sport. And you might enjoy a club, jump in a pool, and suddenly you find yourself swimming with all your friends. Isn't that great affinity? Isn't that a positive influence? It's supposed to be one of the best sports, which helps us move all of our muscles at the same time when we're swimming. When we are swimming without causing any muscle injury. If we mix uh, with people who likes to play uh, bowling, before you know it, you're watching the sport on TV, you mix it with them, and then you find yourself playing bowling as well. The influence happened very subtle without our conscience thought. Now, if I mix with people who are abusing any kind of substance that alters their mood, before we know it, we're taking little dosages until we are completely addicted to that substance as well. So we need to be extremely careful who we associate ourselves with. There are people that we can call friends and bring them into our intimacy, but there are people that we should be only acquaintances, just saying hello and hi from afar. Uh, because if we mix with them, the influence might happen very unconsciously and we end up doing what they're doing. In psychology, for example, it's classic of the attempt of the girlfriend to save her boyfriend from addiction. And what happens in reality, she ends up, she ends up using with her boyfriend. Instead of getting the boyfriend out of the substance abuse, she will end up abusing with her boyfriend. And that's because it's easier for us to go down than for us to bring someone up due to our moral flaws. So we need to be extra careful who we choose to hang out with, our friends, people that we bring into our intimacy. So now that we know that we don't die, we just lose our body, our minds are connected with minds that we have affinity with. And we need to analyze our thoughts to see who we are in sync with. The Spirit's Book, which is the, uh, one of the core foundations of this uh, philosophy, on question 459, the man who organized the book, Alan Kardec, he asked the highly evolved spirits the following question. Are we influenced by spirits? And the answer is, not only we are influenced, but to the degree that most of the time, the spirits are the one who control us. And we don't even realize that we're being controlled. We are puppets in their hands. Now, who are these spirits that control us? And why is it that we are synchronized with them? Remember, it's a choice 
that we make. We choose to sync with whatever kind of spirits that we want to. There are many different kinds of spirits, but our way of speaking, thinking, and doing things will dictate what kind of spirits that we are in sync with. So here we fully understand the following sentence. Tell me what you think, and I will let you know what kind of spirits are in sync with. Because we're never alone. We are always connected with them. So who are the spirits that influence us? Well, we have two kinds of spirits. Spirits who want our well-being and spirits who are seeking revenge. Who are the spirits who want our well-being? Well, there are different kinds. There are our guardian angels or spiritual benefactors. Who are these individuals? These individuals are entities like you and I who went through the process of evolution. They were not created perfect by God. There is one uh, powerful teaching of spiritism, the fact that it explains to us that we all created equally and we went through the process of evolution. We spiritists, we take evolution as the truth. Back in 1864, Charles Darwin published the book, The Origin of the Species, in which he explains the evolution of the species. Now, we take that as being the truth. Spiritism goes hand in hand with science. But, but we also understand that not only the biological view evolves, but also the thinking energy the thinking entity also evolves. So our guardian angel was not, is not someone who was specially created by God, free from work that we have to do to evolve. They were created just like us, simple and ignorant, in other words, lack, lacking complexity and knowledge. Evolution, through hard work, overcome own negative tendencies, imperfections, and sublimating their instincts, they became these individuals that not only they are in charge of themselves, but also they are so evolved that they can be responsible for one individual. And that individual is you. Your guardian, guardian angel's mission is to guide you, is to influence you towards the good path. There are spirits they have achieved a level of ascendancy that not only they are responsible for one individual, but they are responsible for an entire family. And there are those who are responsible for a city. There are those who are responsible for a state, for a country, and spirits who are responsible for a planet. And that's who we consider Christ as being the Earth's governor. So the spirit that is in charge of helping you he constantly or she constantly influences you to do what is best for you. Now, that individual cannot do the work for you. That individual can only help you by putting the choices and influence you to make the best choice. But that person cannot make the choice for you. And why not? Well, that's because a guardian, a spiritual benefactor, is par excellence a teacher. And a teacher does not do the work for the student. Otherwise, the student would never learn himself. One of our responsibilities is to develop discernment. What is discernment? To choose right from wrong. If the spirit makes the choice for us, we didn't develop discernment, our ability to distinguish right from wrong. So he or she will influence us, will present different options, but they cannot make choice for us because it's our job to develop discernment, the ability to choose right from wrong. 
Now, as, we, as you can uh, imagine, that when we make a right choice, you know, how happy they get. Finally, oh my gosh, it took me so long. <laughs> Imagine your spiritual benefactor's mood that you're here to They take a little break <laughs> from protecting us, from helping us. Because when we meet in a place like this, that our main concern is to elevate our thoughts so we can change our behavior. They have done so much work to get us here. And our spiritual benefactors, they are meeting with one another as well to discuss and make different plans of how they can help us grow. So if you there are negative influences against you, please value the amount of positive influence in your life, the amount of people that are there to help you. Sometimes we think they are not there because we have of problems, not realizing that what we label as problems are nothing but opportunities to develop our virtues. We label difficulties as hardships when, when in reality, they are opportunities for us to develop our virtues. It is impossible for us to develop virtues, lacking challenges, lacking hardships and difficulties. If you go up in a mountain and you want to be a, a hermit, you're, you don't want to be with anyone, you just want to be by yourself meditating the entire day, you're not exercising any of your virtues. It is very hard for us to seclude ourselves from time and time uh, from people, but not to run away from society, but to regain our strength and be back to society in order to relate with other people. Because it's through social contact that we develop our virtues. So our guardian angels help us to overcome our obstacles, but she or he not solve the problem for us. They can't. They shouldn't. The things that happen to us, they are part of our incarnation plan. Now there's another kind of spirits that help us. And these are familial spirits or friends from different reincarnation. You know, if you have friends right now, people that you can count on, in this current physical existence. There are certain people in our lives that we can trust them. You know, when we call them, they lift us up and they help us so much. Imagine the friendship we have made in different reincarnation. People who are our relatives or even people in this current reincarnation that passed away and now they help us from the other side of life. Let's say you had a grandmother and that grandmother always counseled you. She tried to help you give you good directions in life. Now that this lady is on the other side of life, she has even a better perception of our own faults, of our challenges. And this is the reason they are even better equipped to help us. We should ask them for help. We should ask our guardian for help. We should ask Christ for help not our familial friends, our family or our friends. Reason being because if, if, if they find in a situation in which they can't help us, it's a source of disturbance for them. Uh, let me talk about money because it's easier to explain the concepts. Let's say you have right here, right now in this physical existence, a grandmother that loves you very much. And you run into cer certain financial difficulties. And if you ask your grandmother for money, she can't help you, how would that make her feel? She'll be disturbed for a while. She wants to help, but she doesn't have the means to help. So we shouldn't ask them for help. We should be aware that they are vibrating for our success. We should be aware that they want to move forward. So we have all this positive influence in our lives. But the problem is that we concentrate so much on the negative influence that we forget 
how much help we have. You know, this spiritist center has a spiritual benefactor. This spiritist center has workers on the other side who wants us to evolve. These are all individuals that have one goal, help us to promote ourselves, help us to promote our own well-being by helping us to work and overcome our challenges. But there are a different kind of influence that we get on the other side of life. And these are negative influences. And who are the negative influences? There are also two kinds of influence. It can be enemies from our past or people who have no reason, no personal reason to hate us, to disturb us, yet they do it just because we're trying to bring light. We're trying to bring knowledge to someone. Let's say you're trying to help a friend, a friend who is very disturbed, a friend who is under substance abuse. They are in pain, but they are completely obsessed as well. Now, that individual is being controlled by spirits from the other side. And if you help them, suddenly these individuals, they become your enemy for the simple fact that you're trying to help that person. They get very mad that someone is trying to get them out of their claws. Someone has a substance abuse problem. They are always accompanied by other beings. How does substance abuse work? When someone is doing drugs, for example, not only they're being physically addicted to the substance, but also they are getting psychologically on that substance. And if they overdose, they're just destroying their physical machine. Now they see themselves on the other side with the same urge and drug they were addicted to. As a matter of fact, they are addicted. They only have lost the vehicle which they obtained drug through. So what are they going to do now? Well, they will approximate themselves to another individual who is doing drugs. And when they approximate themselves, they will absorb from that individual the energy from the drugs. So they have the feeling, the sensation, they're still getting addicted. So someone that is dependent to a substance are never, depend, are never using by themselves. They always have someone else influencing them to do that drug. Now, if you've been to before, there is the, the last round. You know, uh, Andrea Luis, in his Andrea Luis collection, he talks about the last round of alcohol. People sit in a bar and they have a group of friends. There's like six of them. And they look at their watch and says, well, it's 10 o'clock at night. Let's get the last round. So they call for the last round. Last round meaning will be the last one. And then they finish with that last round, and they call it for another second last round. And that would be a third last round, and a fourth last round. You know, they're up to tenth last round. And Andrew Louise explains that it is, in fact, the last round of each spirit that is using them to absorb the energy from the alcohol. This is why it's so difficult to quit an addiction, because they're being influenced by other spirits to do it. If you see someone who's addicted to any substance, they will let you know that they hear this voice in their head saying, go ahead, get high, get high, get high, get high. And they literally call it an obsession. I have an obsession. I hear this voice telling me, get high, get high, get high. 
and the spirits are absorbing the energy through them, through the last round of alcohol. So they're never by themselves. There are always spirits there. So if you're the one who is trying to help someone, suffering from a chemical dependence, now you become that person's enemy. The spiritual obsessor of that individual now hates you. They want to provoke you. They want to cause some sort of embarrassment to you. Now, we don't, we're not telling you to stop helping. What we're saying, be aware that you will get these negative influences. By being aware, now we can protect ourselves. You know, why is it that the spiritual world uh, does not reveal themselves readily so we can all see it? Well, that's because what is the most efficient way of controlling someone else? By making them believe that they're not being controlled. It's a whole world exists, and they constantly influence us. Now, what is a spy, for example? Spy someone that you know steals information, and and they do these things without letting anyone know that they are a spy. If their identification becomes revealed, they are no longer a spy because now there are measures that can be taken to protect our spies. Same process with the spirits. They hide themselves very subtly from us, so we are not aware of their presence, so they can continue to control us. Now, when it comes to spiritism and the spiritist philosophy, we will find many individuals on the other side of life who does not want this message to be disseminated. And why? Because it is such a liberating message. It's a message that empowers people. It's a message that gives the psychological tools to each individual, solve their own problems, and finally become free of the claws of the spiritual obsessors. So someone who uh, is involved in philosophy and someone who's particularly trying to disseminate the message, they are constantly bombarded to the extent May I erase my beautiful drawing? <laughs> Maybe tonight you might have a nightmare of the drawing. Those who are trying to disseminate this message, they will be specially targeted because this message liberates people from the negative influence of these spirits. So there is a book that was received by Divaldo Franco, an individual that most of you know. He received a book from the spirit Manuel Filomeno de Miranda. And this book is called Paths of Freedom. And in this book, he describes a scene in which spirits on the other side of life are gathered together in order to come up with the plan to control us to destroy us. There is another book called um, Liberation. And this book was received by Chico Xavier. In that book, there is an entity who was extremely smart, but yet was using his intelligence for evil purposes. The entire book is about liberating that individual from his own way of thinking. He had many spirits under his command, but when he was liberated, they became furious 
because they lost their leader. Don't we, do, don't we use the same tactics here when we are trying to control or, or bring peace to a certain region of the planet? Don't we go after the leader? Because a group that is leaderless, they don't know where to go. They lose the stamina, their strength. So the highly evolved spirits liberate the spirit Gregorio from his own way of thinking. So all these other entities, they became furious that they had no leader. So the book, Path of Freedom, it's about them choosing a new leader for themselves. And there is a scene in which he describes how they chose this new leader. All these spirits were there like in a theater. And they were bringing different candidates for them to be chosen. Remember, they can be evil, but they're not ignorant whatsoever. They are extremely smart, intelligent. Their work is well planned. Unfortunately, it's all for evil purposes. And as they bring in new candidates, there was this particular candidate that stood out because of all the things that he did in his past life. He was from the era of Jean Giscon, this individual who killed people just to see how they will fall on the floor. Terrible individual. And he was in a region uh, not knowing what was going on with the planet for approximately a thousand years. So when they saw how evil this individual was and how intelligent he was, they decided, they decided to choose this man as the leader of their new group. So now that he was chosen as the leader, he asked them to give, them, to give him some time. Because since he didn't know what was going on for approximately a thousand years, he needed to know. He needed to become aware in order to develop tactics to destroy different groups. So, you know, the spirits let, them, uh, let him uh, become aware that this spiritist philosophy arrived in the planet. There were different groups of people doing good things on the planet. Anyone who was involved with positive work uh, was supposed to be a target for this group. So he took some time to study what happened in the past 1,000 years. And then he said, we have a plan. This is the plan that I want you guys to follow. And what he did was uh, he made sarcasm out of Buddha's four noble truths. You know, Buddha, after he meditated under the tree Bodhya, he was the uh, Prince Saudata Gautama. He meditated for a couple of years under the tree Bodhya, and that's how he became Buddha. Through his meditation, he had this image of the Four Noble Truths. What are the Four Noble Truths? There is pain in life. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor, young or old, famous or infamous, we all have pain. It's an illusion to think that some people are free of pain, but we all have to go through suffering. Then the second truth is every suffering has a cause. Suffering doesn't simply pop up out of nowhere. Every suffering has a cause. Then third noble truth, we must eradicate the cause of our suffering. If we constantly eradicate of our suffering, we're not going anywhere. And the fourth noble truth is how to eradicate the cause of our suffering. Buddha came 750 years before Christ. It's a long time that we as humanity know this powerful information. You know, this alone would do wonders for us. So this man, on the other side of life, he said, I will present to you the real noble truths. And he said, throughout history, 
men and women have fallen to these four dangers, four imperfections, four faults. Should I finish the word? <laughs> Sex. Money. Power. Narcissism. Narcissism. Let's attack individuals and groups of people by using these four tactics. We're going to exacerbate whoever present with these faults. The spirits who are intentionally doing evil things. Just let me open a parenthesis here. There are no evil spirits per se in the sense that they will be forever evil. There are spirits who are extremely emotionally, spiritually sick, disturbed, who are doing evil things. But they will eventually one day transform themselves. It will take lots of pain for them to change. And this is for our YouTube viewers who never heard of spiritism that might assume that we believe in evil entities or the devil. We don't. People who are doing evil things, they are temporarily sick, but they will eventually change because it's the law of evolution. We all will achieve perfection. How fast we get there, well, it depends on how we use our free will. The more we don't fulfill obligation, the longer it takes, the, therefore the longer we suffer. The faster we get there, the less we'll suffer. It's all about our free will. So, these entities who are doing evil things, they do not create the imperfection in us. They exacerbate what we have. They have time to study to analyze us 24 hours, seven days a week, and they observe what are our wicked tendencies. They analyze and study what are our flaws. That's what they do. And by analyzing, studying our flaws, now they know which one they should exacerbate. Because if someone has overcome the negative tendency for the love of power, a spirit will not exacerbate power on that individual. For what? They will lose their time. Someone who has overcome narcissism, they would not exacerbate the individual to follow through his or her narcissism. They will exacerbate something else. So this entity who now became the leader asked the spirits to use this tactic. Observe analyze, find which one, and then exacerbate. Make it greater, make it more intense, so that individual can lose themselves. And when we study history and the reasons uh, people have fallen, you will trace to one of these. First of all, what is sex? It is a human instinct that we all need for physiological purposes. We need sex. From the biological point of view, we must be very thankful to sex because it's through sex that we have combination, that we have exchange of genes that make this humanity uh, so uh, diverse and it's through diversity that we get stronger. We need the mix of genes. You, know, you are 
the byproduct of two entities. You are a hybrid. When your father donated his 23, sper uh, 23 chromosomes and your mother uh, presented her with 23 chromosomes, after they engaged, it became a zygote. The zygote is you. Or do you still believe that you are the product of immaculate conception? <laughs> I know it's hard to think of our parents having sex. <laughs> but that's how we came about. And the zygote grew into a blastocele until it became us. This is the product of exchange of genetic information. And there are few organisms in nature that are asexual. So it's something that we need, we must have. Now, when is it that sex becomes a problem? Well, we all need sex to live. It becomes an obsession. It becomes problematic when we are living just to have sex. That's when it becomes a disturbing factor in our lives. We need sex to live, but we can't, we shouldn't. It's not healthy to live just for sex. It's easier to understand when it comes to food. We need food to survive. It's another basic instinct. You know, animals and insects, they instinctively search for food. It's a basic need. So we need food to live. When does eating becomes problematic? when we're leaving to it. We should eat to live, but there's a lot of people who live to eat. All they do is just think about food all the time. It's a torment now because when they sit down to eat, they are sitting in their breakfast thinking of their lunch. And while they're having their lunch, they're thinking of dinner and dessert. So now food is to pleasure to be a torment. And that's the problem with living to have sex. And unfortunately, there are so many commercials, there are so many outdoors in the media that exacerbates, that excites our mind for us to constantly think about these things. And this is where we understand how the spirits tactic works. You know, the movies and, and the whole exploitation of sex are controlled by minds from the other side of life to keep people enslaved through their own instinctual needs. So if we're constantly thinking of sex, we should be very careful because it might be that we are being obsessed our vital fluids are being absorbed by these entities who are using us to have their sexual needs attended through us. Now, when it comes to being an obsession for groups of people, because I just explained how it is a torment for one individual, but for groups of people, you hear these sex scandals in religious places where individuals are there solely to help themselves to become better individuals. But then you hear a priest involved in a sexual relationship with the child. Then you hear a pastor cheating on his wife, or a spiritist leader being involved in a sex scandal. What could it be? These are negative entities very disturbed individuals who want to discredit religion, per se. When that movie came out, Spotlight, back in 2001, there was a group of journalists in Massachusetts who did lots of research. And they concluded that the, uh, and I am not belittling or disrespecting any religion. This is an analysis. 
they found out there were these priests who were abusing children. And it was not just one or two of them. There were thousands worldwide and many priests involved in this. Now, if you put the amount of priests on the planet and you compare with the amount of priests who are abusing children, the ones who are abusing children are in a very small percentage. But the noise they make with their abuse surpasses all the teaching that good priests are trying to convey. And what happens when that movie hit the world? It completely discredited the Catholic Church. How much work the Pope had to do in order to give some credit back to the church. Credit in the sense of credibility. I believe in this. Now, if you don't believe in a product, you don't buy the product. If I don't believe in an idea, I don't follow the idea. So how could these spirits get a hold of all of us? By making us disbelieve in any religious philosophy of any kind. If a pastor cheats on his wife, has multiple sexual relationships. Now the entire congregation are doubting the teachings. Unfortunately, they associate the bad religious individual with religion itself. They associate the bad behavior of an individual with God and Christ. And some of them, they leave the church. And those who are not even involved in religious services of any kind, they hear this thing and, and it's a reassurance for them. I shouldn't be involved with this. Look at these people. Look how phony they are. They say one thing and yet their personal lives are completely different. If I try to be a Catholic, look what they're doing to children. And why I want to be bothered to be a Protestant when these people are living off my money? and they completely discredit. And there are spirit to center who suffer from the same problems because we are all the same individuals here. And what's the purpose? To discredit. If you come to this place, but in your faith, in the individuals who are here, you are setting yourself up to a big disillusionment. We warn people on the Spiritist Center that we participate, please do not place your credibility, do not place your faith in us. We are imperfect individuals subjected to the same problems that you're having. The reason why you should come here, it's your personal connection with God, with Christ, with your determination to change yourself. Do not put all your hopes in people like us. Because if you do, you will set up yourself for some big disillusionment. Have I made that, so, that very clear? Do not put hopes on people. We are here under challenges, under flaws, with our own instinct, still very strong in our behavior which makes us fail. Paul of Tarsus, he used to say, the things I want to do, I can't. But the things I want to stop doing, it, I'm still doing it. And that's because it's instinct over reason. We already know what's wrong, and yet we still do it. It's instinct over reason. That takes time for us to overcome. We need sex, but we shouldn't live for sex. Otherwise, it becomes a torment. Now, now the, the flyer, flyer that Daniel sent, sent you guys, it said, how can I prevent this? How can I prevent an obsession? Well, if my imperfection, if my flaw, if my weak point is sex, then I should discipline, I should educate my mind. How do I educate my mind? I have to take into consideration place, people, and things that I do. 
For example, the places that we go to influences the way we think, the way we behave. And if I go into a place in which there is sex exhibitions of all kind, what am I doing? I'm exciting my mind. I'm getting connected. That is the mental plug of the spirits to keep me connected with them. If I hang out with people who constantly talk about sex, then I am influenced by them. My mind is constantly excited. And as you know, uh, our good friend presented our bio here, and I've been working in the jail system for the past 12 years. And, and there is a whole floor just for those who are there due to sexual charges. And the point that someone excites their mind is to the extent that they will abuse their own children. Fathers who sexually molest their own female child. It's unbelievable that someone would think of something like that, and they do it. But when you analyze the entire behavior, their minds were constantly surrounded with sex. Today, there are special therapies for couples because there are certain husbands who are addicted to watching porno on YouTube. I mean, the situation was there before, um, before all the media advancement. But people actually had to go, go out somewhere and rent a movie. And there were a lot of people who didn't have the courage of renting a movie uh, because that kind of uh, sort of demonstrated to whoever was renting the movie, you know, I have this disturbance or I have this need. But it's so easy. It's readily available through YouTube. So there are husbands who are breaking up with their wives because they're addicted to porno movies on, on YouTube. So now they, they have to get for that. Now, can you imagine how much the individual allow himself to be addicted by watching something instead of having a real sexual relationship with his own wife? It's very disturbing, and they need a lot of help. So they should, we should educate our minds by also considering things that we do, like watching a movie. If that movie is uh, full of sexual content, and if I am aware that this is what disturbed me, I should refrain from watching that movie. I should tell myself, this is not healthy for you. If there is a commercial on TV, and I know what that commercial is about, I flip the channel. I don't want to create the mental plug. For a beer commercial, you know, people who are addicted to alcohol, it, all it takes them is just to watch one commercial. There is this specific commercial, uh, and commercials are created by psychologists because they know our immediate needs. And there is this particular commercial that this, this, there is this guy, he's dressed in a suit, and he has his suitcase. He just left work. But where is he at? In the middle of a desert. Now, who walks with a suit in the middle of a desert? No one. We know that. Now, what's the subliminal, subliminal message behind that individual in the middle of the desert? It's Friday. I am tired. Uh, they uh, took all my energy. This is how I feel, like a man walking in a desert. And then a train shows up. And this train is full of people drinking beer. And they're all super happy. What's the subliminal message here? I feel tired, exhausted. I should enjoy this train so I could be happy as they are. We know there are no trains in the desert. We know no one walks with a suit in a desert. But the subliminal message is very powerful. So people identify with the character, and they go out and get a beer. That is the mental plug. Because from the beer, they would jump into a henica, vodka, tequila, and for those that I know, to marijuana, cocaine, heroin. It's the cycle. They start with something that's very innocent until they get to the point of doing 
the hardest drug. So they should be very careful with things that they watch. They should be very careful with things that they read, conversations that they have, because all of these factors can be a mental plug. So if I want to prevent an obsession, what should I do? Substitute the places I go to. Substitute negative places by positive ones. Substitute unhealthy people with healthy people, psychologically healthy. Substitute unhealthy things by good things. That's how I will discipline my mind so it won't be exacerbated by these entities who want to hold me, who want to stop me in my spiritual evolution. Is that clear? Money. Do we need money? Obviously we do. We need money to live. It's a material world. We need to pay rent, mortgage, our cars. This is the reason why we work. If it wasn't for the necessity to better our physical condition, we'll still be living in caves. You know, when you study paleoanthropology, it explains that all these activities to better ourselves and our, our, our extreme ability to adapt to change is what caused us to evolve. If everything we needed was given to us, we would still be living in caves and in the trees. So the necessity to better ourselves physically, it's what took us from the, from the caves and made us uh, develop our brain. That's paleoanthropology. So we definitely need money to live. But when we live just to have money, then it becomes a problem. Because the individual sees that it's never enough. Instead of having possessions, they are possessed by what they have. This philosophy does not teach us that we should ride buses forever in order to be highly evolved spirits. It doesn't teach us that we need to walk in order to be highly evolved. It doesn't teach us that we need to be poor to be highly evolved. It teaches us that we need to be de-attached by our possessions. Have possessions, but not allow our possessions to have us. So when is the balance here? It's when I put all my hopes and happiness on having things. And once I have these things, I still feel an existential void. I feel empty in the inside. How many people that we know that have all the things society consider happiness, material wealth, cars, and trips, and vacations, and yet you look at them and they're not experiencing happiness whatsoever. It's a very unfortunate thing that we, uh, we detect this. You know, the highest rate of suicide is among people who have wealth and not poor people. Yet it's not much talk about it. Power. What is power? Power is our ability to influence other people. When we think of power, we suddenly think of politicians, those who manage power. But if we are a father in a house, we have power over other people. When we have, a, if you are a mother, you have power over other people. Just for the fact that you were born as a female, you have more power. People in different companies, when they have power to manage other people, that power can be exacerbated and they lose control of themselves. In the religious scenario, we also see uh, this situation here. Even in our own spiritist movement, we are addicted to having power. When we study this knowledge, who are spiritists? Ex-Catholics and Protestants from different reincarnations. We had positions of power. And now that we become a spiritist, uh, the behavior is right there and is exacerbated. And this can be, can be, it's not always, but it can be manifested in positions that people have. In 
the Spiritist movement. And one of the uh, positions is the position of president. I think this word, it's very detrimental to our movement. And reason being, it's because the word president comes from the verb preside. What is to preside? To dictate orders. Our president, Donald Trump, he give orders to people. And these individuals must obey what Trump says because he is the president. And his employees are being paid for that. Well, is that what happens in a spiritist center? No one is getting paid. We are all volunteers. Therefore, we should not have anyone giving orders. This is why the word director makes more justice to what truly happens. Director is someone that presents direction. It's someone that collaborates. Collaborates to work with, co-labor, labor, work, co, with. It works with by giving directions. That makes more sense. Because the term alone, if I am exacerbated by power, then I think I am on top of everybody. Here I am you know, walking differently. I got my nose up in the ceiling just because I am the president. You know, we create a group. There are four individuals, and one wants to become the president. There are people who are so in love with titles that they create any kind of group so just they can become the president of something. And that's where this works together with this. What's narcissism? It's from the legend of Narcissus. This um, god of mythology who looked at his own reflection in a lake and he fell in love with himself. So he jumped to hug his own reflection out of love <laughs> and he drowned. So how narcissism plays in religious movement or in the spiritist movement? People who believe that only what they do is good. What everybody else do is no good. This causes envy, jealousy, because when we notice someone doing better of what we do, then suddenly we go out to discredit the individual. We attack the individual because we don't want the individual to have authority. And that's because we consider only what we do is good. And we could do this individually by discrediting others, or we could do as groups. Only our is doing the right thing. Or only our movement is right. Only the spiritists are right. It's a gigantic illusion. We are a team. And by being a team, we need to be diverse. If we watch football, for example, if all the players were quarterback, would that be convenient for the team? You guys don't watch uh, football? Yes. If all the players were runners, if all the players played defense, would that be convenient for the team? No. What makes a good team is that the team is diverse. We look at the quarterback and we say, it's important that you are doing your job. I consider what you do important. Quarterback will look at me, well, we need defense. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Particularly to the spiritist movement. It upsets me when I notice this behavior because we lose momentum. We could do so much more if we embraced this idea that we are all important. Our movement is so small, and the small group that we have are constantly being breaking apart 
because of power and narcissism. We should value how important it is. Each player here, we can call it even each soldier, is needed in this struggle to spread this information. But as long as the earth is earth, if there is a very efficient tactic to keep a movement from, from growing, it's to break that group into parts. It's the old concept of divide to conquer. Divide and conquer. So we're constantly being divided. It's a very sad thing. We all need it. Our diversity, it's what makes us rich in a sense of different abilities. When someone comes here and give a lecture and they use the PowerPoint, it's excellent. It's a different style. If everyone spoke like me, how boring that would be. If everyone used the PowerPoint, how boring that would be. If everyone spoke only from the podium, how boring that would be. It's value, diversity. If all of our fingers, if they were thumbs, we would not even be able to grasp a cup of water. It's the diversity of our fingers that gives harmony in the movement. Our entire body is diverse. If we all made of eyes or all ears or all nose, we wouldn't be able to function. It's diversity that brings harmony in the picture. When you look at the subatomical particles, if all particles were made of protons, we wouldn't have the universe. When we look up the astronomical bodies, if they're all moons, we wouldn't exist. Everywhere we look is diversity. And why is it that in the spiritist movement, we want everybody to think the way we do? We want everybody to see things the way we see it. It's a lack of spiritual maturity. So when I consider how important it is, what others do, then I free myself from narcissism. I give importance to others. What you do, it's important. I value you, and we need you. Imagine how strong the movement will be. It's not about the president. It's about the group. As a matter of fact, if anyone has a chance to read books on leadership, being the president is the old kind of leadership that you sit on a throne and you're given orders. New kind of leadership is you sit back, you almost hide yourself from the view, and you make everybody else think that they're doing the job. A good coordinator is someone that looks the potential of each individual and works that potential in order to be, to be developed. That's true leadership. And above all, a good leader is the one that serves. Give example. And that's what Jesus wore. An excellent leader because he served. He washed his own apostles' feet to show that leadership we need to prepare the path for others to follow. That's how we get rid of narcissism. We choose uh, places of less significance. That's how we handle power. It's not the position that we have. It's how we do the obligations that we find in our position. You guys are such an interesting group of people that whenever I come here, the material multiplies itself. And I always find myself running out of time because the subject is very complex and very in-depth. There are many examples uh, I can bring to you, but we run out of time. And I must respect my friend uh, Daniel limitations uh, when he gave to me the limits of the time today. It's uh, 6.30 already. So let me finish with this very small story so we can wrap things up. <laughs> there is a book by uh, a spirit named Umberto de Campos. And there was this individual 
in the story that Umberto de Campos tell that he was responsible for a spiritist center. He was married with kids, and there was this beautiful woman who constantly influenced him. She was being used by these uh, evil entities to discredit the entire institution. So this lady, you know, they went out together just for talks. And he used to say, you know, I, I can't, I can't leave my wife for you. This is an absurd. And this is the kind of argument she had for him. Well, I'm not telling you to leave your wife. You have so much love that you can share amongst both of us. <laughs> and she kept telling her these good things. I told you, they are smart, but for evil purposes. And he held strong for a whole year. But he got to a point that he, he couldn't anymore. There was a spiritual friend who was helping him. This spiritual friend constantly told him, please stop listening to this lady. You know, she is so beautiful. I can see how gorgeous, but this is not healthy for you. You have a family. And this spiritual friend constantly reminded him of his responsibilities. And he was able to hold on for a whole year. But he got to a point, he sat down with her and said, listen, okay, tomorrow night, we're going to consummate our relationship. Let's rent a room in a different city, and we will meet there weekly. So he went home, decided that he would do this, and the spiritual friend literally got desperate. Oh my God, he's going to do it. He's going to lose himself big time. What am I going to do? So he started asking for help. So he went to a different sphere in the spiritual world, and he uh, met with this guy, Guardian Angel. And he explained the entire story, like the guardian angel didn't know. He explained. So the guardian angel listened carefully, because now the guardian angel was sort of training him how to be a guardian angel, too. And he explained, OK, for this kind of situation, the only thing that we can give, it's healthy diseases. And then the spiritual friend said, what? The only way that we can fix this is by giving him a healthy disease. What do you mean by this? So both of them, they descended, and they went to the man's room. He was uh, lying down next to his wife. Uh, both of them were asleep. So now the guardian angel applied his special passes on top of his stomach in order to make him sick. And suddenly, he woke up throwing up. He started throwing up so bad that he became ill. The wife immediately called the doctor. And the doctor said, well, this is a clear case of cholera. I don't know what's going on. You know, how did this happen? And he, he kept losing weight, and he kept throwing up. And, and on the following morning, the other lady showed up. Because, you know, usually they're friends of the family. The other lady showed up. And when, they, when she looked at him, all pale, and when he looked at her, of course, the libido went away. Because <laughs> one good way of getting our libido away is being sick. You know, this is why uh, Viktor Frankl, in his book, Search for Meaning, he describes the scenes of the Holocaust. And people, women and men, used to sleep Together. And there were no counts of sexual abuse or nothing like that. And why? Because the suffering was so unbearable that the libido went out the window. So the disease here was to protect him. And it took him six months to heal from the cholera. By that time, the teachings bound was very powerful to make him understand that this was a way of the highly evolved spirits to stop him from making his biggest mistake. So if you're seeing someone who's sick, <laughs> and you want them to be well, and you're applying passes, you're doing all these things, you're not getting well, maybe this is healthy disease. 
because it's refraining them, refraining them from doing worse things. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Julio, thank you again for this, these beautiful teachings and all the information that we receive here. We always invite everyone to study and go after the literature that we mentioned that we work together. I would say that I'm not going to use the word unfortunate, as we have mentioned in the past, that there are a lot of information, yes, that is still in Portuguese, um, as some of them that he mentioned. But there is a lot right here that is enough for us to learn and to liberate ourselves from some of these difficulties that we see here. But we would like to hear from you if you have any comments, if you have any questions. And since our friend is here willing to answer questions, uh, to answer any questions that you may have or comments, we invite those watching us um, on the web as well to certainly uh, share your comments and your questions so we can ask here. This is a good moment that we're all learning, we're all sharing. And uh, as we give some time for our friend to recuperate his voice as well as for us to formulate our questions, let me say one thing. There is no such a thing as a stupid question. There's no such a thing of, oh, maybe if I ask this, someone will um, you know, say something or think something of me. Remember, we're studying influences. And sometimes there are friends that come with us to the Spirit Center from the other side to study with us. And perhaps the question that we may have may be a question that we're helping someone else that needs some information. So don't be afraid. It's OK. You're in a, in a safe environment, in a good environment that nobody's here to judge. So our dear friend, Abby. <laughs> she will break the ice. Thank you for your concern. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really wonderful. And what came up for me was if you have a friend who is constantly attacking you, you, do n you have discernment not to be around that person. But if it's a family member, somebody that you're really close to, um, and this, obviously, this is a personal um, situation for me where there are family members that are constantly attacking me. This has gone on for years, and then what I try to do is really detach with love because it's so toxic un and unhealthy but I do question myself, why does this keep happening? It's so intense and it's constantly going on. Um, I know there's a lesson there for me, although I feel like I keep making the same mistake over and over again, letting them in. And then there's a voice in my head, maybe it's from the other side saying, you must stay away from these people. You keep making the same mistake over and over. So that's my question. <clears throat> uh, before we go on to the answers, would you please stand up again? I, 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 We're good? <clears throat> good. <clears throat> First of all, uh, did everyone understand the question she asked? Mm -hmm. Good. So I um, will base my answer, how all answers should be based in a place like this, a spiritist center. The authority of spiritism are the highly evolved spirits. And we have the answer to your question on the spirits book. 
The Spirit's book is divided into four parts. The primary causes, the spiritual world, moral laws, and uh, solace as the fourth part, hopes and solace. So the third part, moral laws. We have 12 chapters. Chapter 8 of moral laws are called law of society. In the law of society, we have a sub-chapter called family ties. And when you read those questions about family ties, we will find out that the people that we are with are individuals that we know from past reincarnations. Because all my time I spent here was talking about spirits who are not directly our enemies per se, but they are enemies of anyone who's trying to evolve. But there are spirits who are our enemies for personal reasons. And reason they are our enemies for personal reasons is because we have done something to them in a previous reincarnation. And as a result, they're seeking revenge with their own hands by being difficult relatives. Now, there are different situations here. If it's my child that is being difficult to me, I should ask myself the question, what have I done to this individual? for this individual to treat me like this. And it is my responsibility to educate that child. There are many people who disbelieve in the concept of reincarnation because they ask the following question. Why is it that I can't remember who I was? How, can't I, how come I can't remember my previous lives? If they only knew how beneficial it is forgetfulness, they would never ask that question. Because if there is a detrimental emotional force in us that literally stops us from moving forward, it's guilt. Guilt, it's such a consuming detrimental emotional emotion that literally hurts people from evolving. So the reason we are uh, in a state of forgetfulness of our past is so we have this illusion that we have a, a new beginning without literally not beginning anything. We are the same individual using different biological vehicles as we call the body. When we enter a new biological vehicle, we have the sensation that we're starting something new. But we didn't. We are the same old spirit having a physical experience in reincarnation, the action of re-entering the flesh. So then we forget, so we have this sensation of a fresh start. But subconsciously, we know who harmed us. Subconsciously, we know the people that we have difficulties with. At times, you might see a mother who has four kids. Three are excellent kids, and one of those kids are terrible. She will concentrate all her love in the bad kid. The other three ones might even become jealous by saying, you know, how come we do everything good and she loves him? We don't understand. That's because the mother subconsciously knows that's the one that needs the work. He's the one who needs to be educated, to be loved, because the work with the others have been done. So we reincarnate amongst our enemies because ultimately we're supposed to love everybody. We are the same human family. And being the same human family, our job is to love. What is to love here? Love is not necessarily an emotion that we will have with a difficult person. Love is how we treat people, difficult people. You see, Christ is a great psychologist. And he asked us to love our enemies. If you want to elaborate on that, 
on that subject. That's chapter 12 of the Gospel according to Spiritism. What is to love our enemy? Well, is it to have the same feelings that we have for a friend? Obviously not. What we call love, the emotion, is the result of affinity. We like the same stuff. Then, with time, we build trust. We become friends. And that's what we call love. Affinity, trust, love. An enemy, someone that proved to us they don't like us. They want, to see, they want to see the worst of us. How can I love this individual? The emotion. It's not the emotion. It's the action. I would treat them kindly. I would treat them as I wanted to be treated. So if we have sick relatives who constantly provoke us, and if we are in the blink of strangling them, the best thing that we can do is to be away in order to avoid something worse. There are people who can be extreme uh, enemies when they're close, but relatively friends when they are afar. You know, there are many people who seek psychiatric or psychotherapy help to find out if they should divorce or not their partner. And then it's very dangerous for us to counsel someone to divorce the other person, because if we're influencing them to make a bad choice, we will be responsible with them for that bad choice. This is why we should not tell people what to do. We present them the options, and it's up to them to make the choice. We are not going to be held responsible for making a bad choice with them. But if they are in the blink of killing one another, if they're telling you, well, you know, I'm purchasing a gun tonight, and tomorrow I will definitely shoot him. So by all means, you tell your friend, run away. Don't do this. Because after they do it, the regret is so unbearable that they find out that they destroy their lives, their kids' lives, and an entire family by doing that. And they didn't really kill the other individual. They just liberated the individual from the body. And now that individual finds themselves on the other side to constantly torment them, become a real obsessor. If they're here and we cannot get along with them and we distance from themselves, at least physically we are apart. But if I kill someone that I hate, I just gave that person freedom to obsess me the entire time. It baffles me how we still have capital punishment going on. If people knew what capital punishment is, I'm going to kill you because you killed someone. Uh, first of all, how can we teach people not to kill by killing? Second of all, if I have that sick individual, emotionally disturbed individual, I want to know where the, that individual is. We place them in so they rehabilitate themselves. Ideally. That was supposed to happen. But when I kill them, all I have done, I just liberated that individual from their biological vehicle. And that same individual will continue to torment the society that was responsible for miseducating him or her. So with our difficult relatives, when we can no longer be next to them, if it's unhealthy, if we are exacerbating our animosity, then we should keep distance and pray for them. Because when Jesus asked us to pray for our enemies. Remember the waves I have drawn here? Let me draw them again because if enemy you, if this is the wave of hate and you hate your enemy, what happens? You are in sync. From afar, they are controlling you. They are sending you all these negative vibrations. Now, if we pray for our enemy, it's a different, they're actually the opposite. The, the, the higher they get, the smaller the waves get. But it's difficult to draw them here. <laughs> so if I pray for my enemy, then this wave here is very different than this wave. Are they in sync? No, they are not. So when Christ proposed that we pray for our enemies, it was also protection uh, to, uh, for us. 
By praying, we're not being connected. We're not in sync with our enemy. So they're not controlling us. And most importantly, by understanding this knowledge, I will see them as emotionally sick. And if I consider myself to be a healthy individual, it's only my obligation to pray for them, to wish them well. That doesn't mean I have to invite them for Christmas dinner if I don't like them or they don't like me. Okay? You're more than welcome. Thank you, Julia. Anyone else would like to ask a question? <clears throat> Hi, Julie. I have a friend, and she adopted a child from China. When she brought the child here, the child started uh, showing kind of a bad behavior, and she called her attention. And she said, I don't want to do it, but I hear a voice telling me to do it. So can a child be obsessed? Of course. Uh, one thing that it's very interesting uh, from the uh, psychological point of view, is that auditorial hallucinations, it's a well-known fact in psychiatry. And for the uh, psychiatrists, there is some chemical imbalance that causes the child to have auditorial hallucinations. And I always wondered, how come they don't ask themselves the question, why is it that these voices are always negative in nature. The voices never tell children, you know, you are special. I'm listening to a voice and the voice is telling me, I am loved. It's always negative in nature. They should ask themselves that question so they understand, you know, the origin of something very disturbing here. But for them it's just a chemical imbalance. So that child can definitely have an obsessor. But uh, what would be the course of action here? To take that child to a psychiatrist. Because obsessors, they work on our central nervous system. So we need double treatment. The psychi psychiatric treatment plus the treatment that we should receive at a spiritist center. What is the treatment that one should receive at a spirit to center. Treatment number one, the lecture. What are we doing here together? We are going through this process of a group psychotherapy where I am treated first because my voice reached my ears first and then your ears. We are in a group therapy right now. Treatment number two, the passes, which is just a complement of the lecture. If I come here just to get the passes, it becomes inefficient. And why? Because it gives me temporary relief. When I listen to the lecture and I change my way of thinking, I am disconnecting myself from my spiritual obsessors. It's through self-change that we create new connections. We sync ourselves with our guardian angel. And for that, I need to learn, apply, and live the message in my life. So then we listen to the lecture, and then we get the passes. Third treatment will be the magnetized water. And why the water? Well, that's because we understand that water is one of the most malleable elements of the planet. And the highly evolved spirits, they can manipulate the molecules of matter to give beneficial factors to it. So when we drink that water, we're drinking medicine. And that sit. If we have volunteers, you know, a, a, a volunteer group that visits the elderly or, or visit the poor children, that's also a very good therapy so people can see other people who are suffering. And that gives them a different perception of their own suffering. And the reason I say this thing is it's because there are mediumship meetings at spiritist centers. And some people might make the mistake of bringing someone who is obsessed to a mediumship meeting to remove the spirits. And all they're going to do is just to make the situation worse. Because that individual is not psychologically stable to hear the information they will hear. Because the spirits, you know, they are real. It's just, it's just not a game. And by bringing that disturbing individual into that meeting, 
we're only going to intensify their disturbance. So what treatment should we provide? The psychiatric treatment and the spiritual treatment. Lectures, passes, and water. Anyone else? We're moving to the last question. Comment? Yes. From the previous. But thank you so much for your wonderful insight and enlightenment. I was thinking about to the arrange how to say to break down a group is to inflict or infuse doubts. I don't know if it's because I saw recently that movie called Doubt uh, that the priest has been, they never proved that he, he might have been a predator of a sexual predator and a boy, but never was clear. But that ruins completely the reputational self-esteem and in a subtle way, you know, which is almost I would say diabolic, you know. So, how are you going to deal with this or be aware? I, I, I'm not quite sure if I understood what you were asking. Uh, the, the technique of spreading doubt, how are we going to fix the doubt? <clears throat> well, the only way that we can fix doubt in our own personal lives is that we are genuine, that we have integrity. What is integrity? Doing the right things, even if no one else is watching. Paul of Tarsus used to say that we have a cloud of witness watching us. Well, the spirits are watching us. They know when we're being phony, and they know when we're being integral having integrity, because those who are around us, they will be copying our behavior. They are watching us. So those who are involved in any religious movement, they should live the message. They should be emotionally healthy. They should make an effort to overcome their imperfections. That's how we make people believe. But we have to... Um, take into consideration that our job here is not really to change how others think. We have to concentrate in ourselves. What I mean by this, if I make all the efforts to remove these behaviors from my life, automatically I'll be helping people around me because people will watch what am I doing and they will copy the behavior as well. If they don't copy the behavior, they receive the message that this is not the right path, that they should do something else with their lives. And by that, I'm spreading credibility. You know, we, we, we say to ourselves, well, there are still good people on this planet. <laughs> this is what we hear. And there are a lot of good people on the planet. The problem is, is that bad news sells. And we think that the world is just a big mess and that's because we don't watch good news on TV. But do they happen all the time? Yes, they happen all the time. As of now, someone can be thinking, you know, what people are doing on a Saturday night? Oh, everybody goes out to have fun. Would they believe that we are here talking about this stuff? Thinking about how we can change ourselves and better ourselves and move forward? No. Is this a good thing? Yes and it happens all the time. We just are not aware of. So that's how we spread credibility, by being honest, by being integral. Thank you, Julie. What, just to, uh, now, when you started the question about doubt, one, one of the techniques as well uh, of the uh, spiritual obsessors is to spread skepticism and you to doubt yourself. Because when we doubt ourselves, then we never change. We're given in. We say to ourselves, I am a terrible individual. I am not worth of anything. 
we're doubting our own capability. And for that, Christ gave us the medicine. When he said, you are God's, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Why would Jesus say that you are God? You know, it's not me. It's Jesus himself said that we are God's. God's in the sense that we are creators. We create our own lives. We have to believe in ourselves. By not believing ourselves, we cannot go anywhere. You know, even materialists and atheists, scientists, understand the power of belief. This is why they have double-blind studies on medication. And why? Because if you give a medication to someone, telling them that this is medication to help you, just the belief that the medication will help, helps them. So they don't know if it was the efficacy of the medication or because they told them. So they have to conduct a double-blind study. Even if the doctor knows who's getting the medication, influences on the outcome of the study. And why? Because the belief of the doctor in the medication changes the result. And there's also the nocebo effect. Most people don't know that, which is when you give them a medication, you say this medication will make you puke, and people are taking a sugar pill, and they're puking because they believed the uh, negative effects of the medication. So belief is very powerful. We must believe in ourselves. You are a spirit with the potential to achieve perfection, and it's up to you to make the choice by using your free will wisely. Mr. Leo? I don't want to say that I lied, but we have one more question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all right. I'm just concerned about you. Go ahead. No, we can go all night long, but uh, I, we I'm have fine. other things it's to do, too. I'm concerned with you. And I'm pretty sure, no, I'm okay. So the question comes from our friend Renata. Um, please forgive me if I chop this name. Bergfeld, and she asks the following, and I'm going to read it as she actually posed online. Oh, okay. As Julio just answered about the treatment to the person that is obsessed, I wondered, can he talk about the treatment of the obsessor when the person who obsessed is brought to the spirit to center, please? <clears throat> the spiritual obsessor when he or she no longer have access to that person's mind, their spirit, their soul, that spirit can take two different paths. One, it can try to continue to disturb that individual by disturbing the family members, by disturbing the group that is helping them, and if they find that it's very difficult to break through because that individual literally changed the way they think. The person who received the help changed the way of thinking so they are no longer synchronized. No matter what the spirit does, because the person elevated their way of thinking, how do we elevate the way of thinking? By reading, studying, becoming aware, and applying the message into our lives. We change the way we're thinking and we no longer are in sync with that individual. The disturbed spirit might do anything to bring that person back again to that lower level. And they do these things by first telling that individual, get out of this spiritist center. You're just wasting your time. You're no good. Who are you lying to? That person starts to disbelieve themselves and give up. If you are feeling any emotion that you want to give up and get out of here, please open your eyes very widely because this is a spiritual obsessor who is trying to take a hold of you. When we are in a group of people like this, we are getting the support that we need. At home by ourselves, we are easily controllable by them. Anyone who leaves a group is under an obsession. If they leave because they want to be by themselves, I'm wasting my time with this group, and suddenly they isolate themselves, one sign, one evidence of obsession is a person or a group of people that likes to isolate themselves. 
because this isolation avoids criticism from other people. And it's through criticism that we become self-aware of what's going on with us. Be very aware if we are getting any influence to leave a group because it is the source of our help. So that spirit will continually to disturb that person by doing that. And if the person continues to study, work, involve themselves in volunteer services to keep their, sem th their thoughts elevated, they shouldn't worry about these disturbed spirits. To worry is to be constantly thinking about them, but one should never put our guards down. As long as we, this, we are in this physical plane, we are susceptible to being obsessed. That was the message of Jesus being obsessed in the spiritual, in, in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Would Jesus actually give in to the obsession? Absolutely not. He is a perfect being. But well, that was to give us the lesson that whenever you're on this physical, spiritual plane, the physical plane, it doesn't matter who you are. We are susceptible to the influences of negativity, to the influences of sickly, disturbed individual. This is why he also recommended pray to get the strength and then watch. What is to watch? To keep our eyes widely open to any situation that might bring us down again. If my problem is alcoholism, what would be to watch? Well, if a, a friend of mine invites me for a simple beer in a bar, I should watch. That could start the entire process again. Now, the spiritual obsessor can look at this individual and say, well, she changed, or he changed. Look how happy they are. And here I am, all disturbed. I'm unhappy. I am really sad. You know, what have I achieved by obsessing this individual? You know what? It's time for me to give up. I, I, I want something better for myself. And as the individual, as the spiritual obsessor is considering to change themselves, then they mentally become accessible to their guardian angel. And their guardian angel says to them, you know, enough is enough. You know, you're not a victim. They are not a victim. Both of you guys are responsible for what took place. But it's enough is enough. Time for you to start getting better. So they are taken to spiritual hospitals where they will start their therapeutic process. So when there is a mediumship meeting at a spirit center, that spiritual obsessor will come and leave in the medium the energies that was so called by Alan Kardec in the medium's book. They receive an invitation to change. A spirit who has been an obsessor for 20, 30 years cannot change with a simple conversation of 15 minutes. What goes on in a mediumship meeting is that the spirit opens up his mind to consider the possibility of change. And by opening up their mind for a possibility of change, they become susceptible to get the help. And that's how they leave the individual. But let's say the spirit gets better, move on with his life, and the individual, the ex-obsessed individual, not that they're better, and they say, well, my life is improved, so let me start doing my old things again. I'm all well. And what's going to happen? They, the, he or she will eventually synchronize with all the spirits and she become disturbed again. So there is the work that we have to do to keep ourselves elevated. Final comments or we're good? We don't have time <laughs> for... <laughs> <clears throat> I, all, uh, I like to uh, always say the poem of Castro Alves at the end of the lectures uh, because it gives us such a, uh, such a nice synthesis of everything that we have said. But since it's very late, I'm just going to give you the last stanza of the poem, uh, which is, um, in the entire universe, divine heavenly verses decree march on. A heavenly love awaits. Have hope, have faith toward the infinite to come. Thank you, God, for the blessing of speaking. And to you all, thank you for listening. <laughs>